sometimes when people ask what the cold Man millions is about, I say it's about 320 pages. Uh, but if they're serious, I say uh, the cold millions is a novel about two brothers who get caught up in the uh, free speech riots of 1909 and social unrest and economic inequality that echo the world we live in now. And she was a labor organizer in the early 1900s who, from the time she was about 15, traveled west um, working with um, miners and, and itinerants and all sorts of workers to, to um, give basic free, basic rights to workers. She also fought, she was a suffragist in her life. She helped, she was one of the founders of the ACLU and the chairwoman woman of the chairperson of the uh, Communist Party USA. Um, was jailed, um, fought for civil rights, really kind of an amazing 20th century figure. And I do feel like she slipped between the cracks. She's not quite labor organizer, not quite suffragist, um, being involved with the Communist Party and, and going to Russia, I think, um, you know, changes the way history looks at you. But in 1909, the period I focused on, I was just fascinated by this pregnant 19 year old labor activist standing on the street corners of Spokane, demanding that we emancipate the vagina and give workers basic rights. I just thought what an incredibly modern, heroic figure to incorporate into a novel. I was really drawn to this almost elemental moment of labor history when, when labor is an idea more than an organization. And the Wobblies, the industrial workers of the world, were to me the most idealistic of unions. Uh, at a time, 1905, 1906, when to be in a union was to be a white man with a trade. Um, they said anyone could join a union, women, um, Native Americans, people of color, anyone with a job could join the IWW, the Wobblies. Um, 1909 was this period when they really were taking the mantle, fighting for uh, indigent um, uh, itinerant workers, hobos, essentially. Um, and in Spokane, uh, they they really led this this battle in which the the uh, um, they had been banned from speaking on the street, and so they organized free speech riots in Missoula, Spokane, Fresno, um, and it was really. Um, sort of the high point of their of of the Wobblies' influence um, from there until about World War One, they were they were pacifist, and so by World War One, they had sort of gone against the tide of American history by saying we shouldn't be involved in World War One. They were outlawed not long after, uh, raided, their leaders arrested. But in this early 1909 period, when I wrote about them, I I really wanted to write about this kind of heroic idealistic movement rising up out of you know pure class um, uh, egalitarian dream um, it's funny to be talking about labor history because the book really is i really wanted to write a sort of big rip roaring turn of the century you know post-western so ursula the great was very much that sort of character and i had been reading so much about the theater scene in my hometown spokane washington which was apparently in the early 1900s next to san francisco about the most desirable place you could arrive as a theater performer um, douglas fairbanks and clara bow and all everyone made their way to spokane to do shows and but there was a seedier side that really interested me the vaudeville theaters where they would people would perform with animals, they would wrestle horses, um, uh, anything they could get away with that would draw the working men. And in my research, I was one day I, I just jotted down Ursula the Great sings and dances with a wild cougar. And I, I had to go back and realize that I had invented her. Um, I, there was no Ursula the Great, but my research was so um, was so immersive that I almost didn't remember. Uh, in the novel, she's I, I wanted to, to build her because um, uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn represents one kind of female agency in the novel, this person who stands up and fights. And I wanted to show um, another character who, um, who existed within this incredibly misogynistic system and still thrived in her own way. Um, and she she's one of those characters who just walks it, walks up to the writer and sort of announces herself, you know, and um, spoke in this 
um, language that I, it, it, those kinds of characters are just so much fun to write. And she just marched up and said, a woman owns nothing in this world except her memories and what a terrible return on investment that is. And from that moment, I just thought, oh, I wanna know this character. That's mostly true. Although I was thinking of taking some days off and then the reviewer all of a sudden says, keep at it. And so now I feel terrified, like someone's going to catch me snoozing on a day when I should be working. But I have this great office with a sleeping chair over there and a sleeping couch over there. And I have all kinds of books here that I like to grab and go nap and read with. So um, what I call work, other people would call um, uh, somewhere between contemplation and sleep. So while it is true that I come out to my office and type something every day, I can't say that I'm doing um, uh, that, you know, that I'm doing efficient work every single day. But yeah, my my wife said I said it's not really 365 days a year, and she said it pretty much is. Mm -hmm.